the context in which the conservation of momentum shows up the most prominently is in collisions. What do I mean by collisions? Well, a collision are when two objects interact and we can neglect the forces from outside their interaction. That's really all it needs for a collision. We can treat interactions as collisions even if the objects never actually touch each other. All that matters is the equal and opposite force pairs from the interaction are all that we have to worry about. It's convenient to class collisions into several different types. The different types mandate how we can treat them mathematically. So let's briefly look at them. We'll start with the simplest first. The simplest is the totally inelastic collision. In this type of collision, the objects cling together after the collision. Mathematically and physically, what that means is the interacting objects have the same velocity after the collision. Because this is an isolated system, total momentum is conserved in the collision. Kinetic energy, however, is not conserved. So here's how we can mathematically treat totally inelastic collisions. Begin with a very general statement of conservation of momentum. Total momentum of the system initially, that's on the left, is equal to the total momentum of the system after the collision, that's on the right. If we're talking in the simple case of two objects in the system, we can break down the total momentum into the momentum of object 1 and the momentum of object 2. Next, we can express the momentum as mass times velocity, so this is just spelling out the interaction in more mathematical detail. Bear in mind that what I've shown so far applies to every kind of collision, whether totally inelastic or some other type. Now if the collision is completely inelastic, we have the additional consideration that the final velocities are the same. So here the v1f and v2f, we'll just call vf because that's the same final velocity. That's a common factor on the right-hand side of the equation. We can factor it out to say that the right-hand side of the equation is the total mass times the final velocity. Not too surprisingly, when the objects are traveling together, the total momentum of that system is their velocity times their total mass. We start with where we left off last time. On the left we have the total momentum of the system. On the right we have the total momentum of the system. So if we're given, say, the masses and velocities of the particles before the collision, it's a simple matter to find their velocity after the collision. Here's how we do it. We have the velocity already factored out on the right-hand side. All that we have to do then is divide both sides of the equation by the total mass. What we end up with is the final velocity equals the total momentum of the system divided by its total mass. We'll soon see that this means that both particles move along with the center of mass after the collision. One thing that I left out from the previous analysis is all the vector quantities in there really are vectors and they do act as vectors. So momentum being a vector, velocity being a vector, all of those can be treated as vectors. And when we're dealing with higher dimensions, such as the two and three directions of possible motion, the vector nature is very important in actually carrying out calculations. Again, Looking at a completely inelastic collision, the final velocity is equal to the total momentum divided by the total mass. When we look at these as vectors, all the velocities as vectors, we actually have an equation for each dimension. We have an equation for the x components of the final velocity. We have an equation for the y components of the final velocity. Because of that, we have enough equations to solve for all of our unknowns, all the different components of the final velocity. So the procedure to fully characterize the final velocity is simple. It's straightforward but tedious. Next we'll look at inelastic collisions. These are inelastic collisions that are not totally inelastic. In these collisions, the objects do not move together after the interaction. They bounce apart somewhat. However, their relative speeds will be a little less than it was initially. In this system, total momentum is still conserved. Total kinetic energy is less than the initial kinetic energy, but it's more than you would have in the case of the totally inelastic collision. Solving these partially inelastic collisions are more complex. Their final velocities aren't the same, so we have more unknowns. As a result, we need more equations to solve for these additional unknowns. We need to know, say, what one of the final velocities is, or some other clue, such as the direction of one of the final velocities. These problems can be fairly complicated to solve in the general case, so it's a very interesting practice to try to work out all the math you need. I've alluded to the vector nature of velocity and momentum in these collisions. In a one-dimensional case where you have the objects constrained to move in a single line, the math is fairly straightforward. In the two- or three-dimensional condition, the velocities can be in any direction, before or after the collision. What we always know is that the forces, impulses, momentum changes, and velocity changes are in opposite directions for the two interacting bodies. 
The interesting complication that's added is that impulses and momentum changes, and of course velocity changes, can be in different directions from the initial velocities, so they can bounce off in all sorts of different ways. In real collisions, we cannot always assume that momentum of the system is conserved, because of course, the system will lose momentum due to friction with objects outside the system. However, in most cases, it's quite appropriate to ignore these outside interactions. The interactions of collisions themselves tend to be for very brief times. As a result, the forces within the collision are appreciably larger than any forces that system experiences from outside. In terms of the overall picture, momentum is still conserved in the universe if you draw your system to be big enough to include all the interacting objects here. The third class of collisions is the elastic collision. In elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved, as well as momentum. Objects bounce apart after the collision. They maintain the same relative speeds as they had before the collision. By relative speeds, I mean relative to each other, relative to the center of mass. Total momentum is conserved in an elastic collision, just as it is conserved in any kind of collision. As with all kinds of collisions, some momentum is transferred from one object to the other. The special thing about an elastic collision is that kinetic energy is conserved. The total kinetic energy of the interacting objects is the same after the collision as it was before the collision. We know that the final velocities of the two objects are different after the collision. Both of them are unknown. Kinetic energy gives us one more equation that we can use to solve for this. So this works fine for motion along one dimension, along a defined path. However, in two and three dimensions we run into a problem. Momentum gives us a separate equation for each dimension. That's very useful. But in the case of an elastic collision, we have two unknowns in each dimension, the dimensional component of the velocity of the first particle and the dimensional component of the velocity of the second particle. Conservation of energy gives us only one more equation to work with, because energy does not have components. It's not a vector. So in two and three dimensions, we're coming up short. We don't have enough equations to fully solve for the final velocities. So what we need to do to solve this is we'll need more equations, say, the direction of one of the velocities, or the direction of one of the velocity changes. 